Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 214 for Monday, June 10th, 2019. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. Back in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Los Gatos, still in Los Gatos, it's Paul Kent. How you doing, Mr. Kent? Good, man. It was so nice to see you last week. I had a lot of fun with you. We did. We uh, we got to see each other. We got to play together, and I got to hang enjoy out. California weather. We got to hang out. Yeah, it was all good. Yeah, yeah. Got a meal. Yeah, it was good. We did. We actually got two meals together. As it, as it worked <laughs> That's right. out. I don't know. A pre gig meal and a and a and a heading out of town meal. It's true. It's true. It's good. I have. I you really I, you played great, man. It was really fun to just just plug you in and just see you back there. You just sat in and just crush it. I mean, I knew you would. I, I mean, because I know you and I know, I know your, I know your capabilities. I, I, I was going to say, I know your prep, you know, your, your, where your values are with regards to prep, but I know your capabilities. I was thinking about how that's a big part of a leader and what you can do on stage. You know, if you know, like, like I know there are some guys who in my band, who really are very uncomfortable if I deviate from the script, if I, you know, break a song down and, you know, they're like, Oh, where's this going to go? Am I not, am I prepared for this? I mean, and then there's other guys who live for that type of stuff. That, I, I, I'm I, someone who's, I live for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But anyway, you know, knowing that a, you have a great encyclopedia of this, you know, classic rock knowledge. Cause what do we play? We played, played taking care of business. Uh huh. We played sweet home, Alabama. Uh huh. And we played Highway to Hell. That's correct. All right. Three three standards. Yeah. So, um, and we do have some listener questions and comments to get to, but we're here, so we might as well do this. So, right. We played three standards. Um, there was an interesting thing that happened, right? We, uh, we played the, f- we rehearsed, we sound checked with one song. And that was the only one that I had rehearsed with you guys, right? Which was Highway to Hell. And Nick sang the heck out of it, which really amazed crazy. me. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. Uh, in the, actually, not even in the original key, because the recorded key is down, you know, a few cents, few percents from A, right? The yeah. song, we played it in A, so he had to actually go up. And he was saying how he could sing along with the record. It was really the top of what he could blow to. And then when we put it in the in the natural key of A, because again, it's, it's detuned slightly on the recording. Sure. And he still just, you know, tightened his belt <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and went up, went up a few more cents. Yeah. No, he sounded great. And so we sound checked with that. And, y- you know, every one of these tunes, but Highway to Hell, I, I mean, they, they all have their little moments, right? Their little events and the, and the turnarounds in Highway to Hell. There are several different ones. And if you don't know the sequence in your head or on a chart, you aren't going to get it right. Right. You know, there's there's the one where it, it, it just turns around. There's the one where there's a pause and then it turns around. And then there's the one where it like has the hits and then a pause and then the hits again. Right. And and so we rehearsed that and uh, we got them all, which was great. Except that then when we got on stage, we hit what I call the sophomore slump, or at least I did, where it was the last song that we had played. The other two had gone well. And I actually have something to say about the other two as well. And then we got to, uh, we got to highway to hell and it was like, Oh, no problem. Like, great. We got the two out of the way that, that we hadn't rehearsed and those went great. So this one's got to go great. And it did it, except I, I effed up the ending. I ended the song before, uh, you know, before the last little bit. Little tag. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. I ended it before the tag. And uh, and that's totally that sophomore slump. Right. You know, it's that confidence that you have and it, it can happen with one song. It can happen with an entire gig. Right. Where, you know, you go out you play your first gig, you're prepared. Everybody's alert. Everybody's aware and everything goes really well because everybody's got big ears and everybody's thinking and like, OK, like we're this is uncharted territory together. So we've all got to kind of make it happen. 
And then, of course, you know, time number two, you're like, oh, sweet. I, and that you're <laughs> way too confident. You know, you're as confident as you could, as you deserve to be after 25 times of doing it. But that between somewhere between two and 25 is when it actually settles in, you know, <laughs> and, uh, but it's after two. It's always after two. It's never the second time that it settles in. So uh, but, you know, it, and it was it was interesting, right, because so you have that. I call it the sophomore slump because that's you know, that's what happens. And um and then um, the trick to that is that I, what, what's the best way to say this? The, the right is a consensus, right? And it's it's not um, it, it's not uh, an absolute. Right. So if and, and really a friend of mine, like when I was in high school, described this to me, he's like, look, man, you got to understand something. He's like, you're a pretty good rock drummer. You know, if you keep at it, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll get better. You'll like, you've got this. He's like, so you have to understand something. You you need to have the confidence to know this. There is one person on stage in a rock band that can end the song and it's the drummer. And he's like, if the drummer doesn't stop, the song's not over. And if the drummer stops, the song's over. Right. And, and so it's like, if the drummer F's up the ending, you go with him, even though, hundred percent of the time he's wrong. Right. You know, and it's, it's just one of those things you just got to, you know, it's like, Oh, okay. The song's over. Like talk about it afterwards, whatever, but on stage. Nope. That's it. It's, it's over. But, um, well, I think that there's a business rule that goes along with this because, um, that, that is in effect, right. For the, for the emotional health of the band. I mean, that's, that's de facto, right? If the drummer keeps going, you know, what are you going to do? Leave him out there. Right. <laughs> well, no, that is it, de facto, right? It's not However, the emotional health. I'm talking about like the, the value of the show. Oh, I, I, I think we're, I'm just using the wrong words. Okay. Yes. Yeah. If you, yeah. if the band wants to play off a, a error. Yes. Those things we all agree to is that if the drummer goes, be ready to save, you know, jump in, jump in. Right. Yeah. However, you know, the, the thing is, if uh, these are there are guys who want the letter of the law and there are guys who want the spirit of the law. You know, I have guys in my band, like I said, that they want to play the song. Right. And I practice the song and I put my time in the song and, you know, we're all agreeing we're going to play the song. So if you come and with a different idea of how the song is going to go, uh, someone needs to you know work this out in advance. Otherwise, our tacit agreement is that we're going to play the song as it is recorded. Cause otherwise you could have in my band, 10 guys with 10 different opinions about how to open up a song or, you know, of recover the song. Right. And, um, I none think, of that matters in the moment. I, oh, I, I, I hear what you're what saying, saying, but none of it matters. Like it, it definitely matters in the rehearsal room, but it, it it's, there's a difference between an intentional detour and a mistake. And oftentimes whoever makes the mistake has to be right because he uh. doesn't know he made the mistake. Right. It, like I've, I've noticed this on stage and it's I mean, it goes all ways. If somebody screws something up, somebody jumps and like the singer jumps and starts singing a verse. It's like, OK, he probably doesn't know that he just did that. So we got to be with him. Doesn't yeah. matter. Right. You know, no. For purposes of what you're talking about, post gig, when you yes. when you talk post about stuff, sure. we say, hey, you know, we never had an agreement that this part was going to continue on. So, right. you know, just know I can live with what happened once. But, you know, we're, we're cool that this is what's going to happen in the future. Right. Absolutely. Hey, and you know what you're saying brings to mind a really interesting thing. It dawns on me that drummers are held out in a unique way for, for goofs different. Everybody else's goofs kind of blend in. Yes. A drummer's goof is held out in a different way. It's similar to a singer, right? You know, I mean, if a singer starts singing the, the chorus, everybody in the audience knows the singer singing the chorus, right? It's, it's a, it's an exposed thing. Uh, but, but you're right. Yeah. Drummers same way. Yeah. No, if a drummer messes up an intro, if a drummer loses time, if a drummer speeds up or slows down, if a drummer yep. doesn't transition things, for some reason, those goofs feel more cataclysmic <laughs> than if a, if a, you know, a, a singer rearranges the form of a song. Sure. And, uh, you know, I think that's kind of a bit the nature of the instrument. I mean, mm -hmm. this is how how essential drummers are. Right. And that drummers who are, you know, really kind of free agents in their thinking are really hard to play with because if you don't know if they don't take accountability that they can't you know yes if the drummer ends a song the song's over if a drummer keeps going however if a drummer is doing that without regard oh. to tacit agreement of the time everybody's put in to learn 
to learn a song and you know those types of things you've got a different type of problem that's yeah mistakes are different than intentional like i no, i like it better this way like that's those are two very different <laughs> scenarios and i've i've dealt with both i there was one bass player i played with down in texas who a phenomenal bass player but he was almost too creative and in the moment he would just change the form of the song every now and then that's cool but it was just like what is you have no idea what's going on like all the time he was just he was a wild card and it was like man like you gotta you gotta dial it in man <laughs> yeah but it is like you gotta you gotta figure that out as a band right and and, and sort that out it the, the um so we didn't we did rehearse Highway to Hell and we played that straight to the record, right? Great. Yep. Um we played Sweet Home Alabama pretty much straight to the record. We played Taking Care of Business and it had nothing to do with the record. Which well, was really it did it did it two thirds of it were straight pretty much straight on. And then you know, I was singing it, so it dawned on me because we didn't rehearse it, and it yeah. was, you know, it's a song for for our our host to get up and play some guitar. But you know, there's the two breakdowns yes, in that song. We only right? did one. That's right. And I I think going back to, I think going back to uh, the Macworld All Star Band, I don't think we got the two breakdowns, no. you know, correct. No, and I think that that's one of those things. That song. That's really what I'm saying. Difficult. Yeah. So I made the call in the moment. Again, this is what I'm saying. The leader. Yeah. Has to have some plan as to what his band is capable of following on what his band is probably thinking in in, in a hive mind type of way yep. you know and and so i just like if i'm just going to cut to a simplified version of the song because we didn't even think to discuss it beforehand <laughs> and you know i don't think anybody could could you know you ended it straight up with me and it sounded like a tight ending and oh, yeah this happened, right? Oh, yeah. No, I knew, I knew as soon as we got to that first break, I'm like, I, you know, I mean, I, I actually went back on the plane and listened to it because I have no idea what's, what's the, you know, you said learn everything to the record. I'm like, man, yeah. that song's different. Every band I've ever played it in because those breaks, interchange, right. They feel interchangeable. Right. And it's like, yeah. okay, so let me get this right. Oh, that's what it is. Okay, great. And then, you know, we're on stage and there's what, you know, a thousand people in the room or whatever. And, and we hit the, the first break and it was like, nope, we're already in the second break. Okay, no problem. <laughs> That's right. Like, yep, we're good. No problem. Everybody yeah. was watching Jim anyway. It was right. his first song. It so. Yeah, it didn't matter. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But it's, it's, you know, those are the, I like those moments. I like having to think in the moment and, and it, it, it at some level, I even like, when someone makes a mistake that that forces the band to like do a measure of like we were playing uh we were playing whatever we were playing at um that we had a monkey fist gig on saturday night after i got home and it was great it was out on this deck of a golf course and really nice night great thing and there was one song where johnny was just like like he had gotten in his head about something and could not like settle into the tune and so there were a few like turnarounds that were measures of two instead of measures of four. And he just came in and it was like, but I kind of like those moments. I mean, again, if they happen re repeatedly, then, we, then that's a problem. Right. But if they happen like once, it's actually kind of funny and it gets everybody to pay like everybody on stage to pay attention. It's like, Oh, yep. Got to sort that out. Like, so I'm, kind of I'm guilty of this in a unique way. So when I break a song down and I talk to the audience in the middle, Sometimes when I'm done talking, I'll have a hard time finding one. Oh, sure. And sometimes I will I will count the band into a new section of song on the two or on the three, actually. Right. Right. And, right. you know, the funny thing is, uh, like I said, there are some guys who in precision literally makes them crazy in the way lack of tuning, you know, can make someone crazy. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but, you know, most of the guys just go with it. I mean, the, you know, the band is largely. Uh, or the audience is largely not tuned into counting one, two, three, four. No, they don't know. And I mean, so they might, it, but yeah, but it doesn't. Yeah. Matter. Right. But a lot of times, you know, again, if an, and if it's a drawn out thing where I'm talking over a beat. Yeah, then it doesn't you know, matter either way. Yeah. One and three are, are you know, you're not access, accenting one that, that makes one feel yeah. any different. But that's right. If you're counting. Right. And but that is a fun thing, because I get called on that by a couple of guys in my group. You know, dude, you did it again. When you talk to the band, <laughs> look at us to get the one or something like that. And I'm like, I get it. I get it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like that doesn't bother me. Somebody being out of tune that that that, I, that I'll I'll take issue with. But OK, um, I'm going to pause you right there because this is something I've been waiting to bring up for a long time. OK, I'm going to talk to my brothers that are guitar players out there. 
when you know guitars because a they're uh for many of us we play them pretty physically we 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 hit them pretty hard you know when we're hitting power chords and that type of stuff guitars and then you have weather conditions sure guitars are subject to going out of tune something keyboard players don't deal with too much something drummers don't deal with and to a much lesser degree drum drums go out of tune but not not in a in a tonal way i I, that's what i'm saying yeah right so anyway <clears throat> when at first blush, a guitar starts to be out of tune, a guitar player goes through a certain checklist. Where am I in the song? What is the effect of me stopping what I'm doing to fix a tuning thing right now? What is the, what is the pluses and minuses of me chugging on, you know, as I am until I get to a convenient place Total. to tune? It's not that guitar players don't know, but I am just amazed how, you know, bands, you know, guys, keyboard players, drummers, tune up, tune up. Of course, I know that I need to tune up. I'm evaluating the best plan about when to do that. Sure. Right. So I can, I can drop everything and tune up right now. It's going to screw up the song for, you know, 25, 30 seconds while I get to there. Is this a good part of the song for me to do that? But it is just, I find that just so incredibly frustrating when, when people like guitar players can hear it. Trust me, every guitar player out there is nodding their head right now. Guitar players can hear it. We're going through a mental checklist. They're just like tune up, tune up, tune up. Yeah. I would never tell someone to tune up in the middle of a tune, but like it, at the end of the tune, generally, that's where you can do it. I mean, if there's some breakdown or whatever and, and there's enough time and you can make well, it Well, it depends happen. how out of tune you are. It I mean, also if it also depends on how out of tune you are. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But my point is, is that a guitar player hears himself out of tune. It's not that they're not hearing it. They're some making of, some of them. You probably do. I, I, I don't. But th- I have dealt with some that it's like. Dude, you've been out of tune for three songs. <laughs> like, the, the, like, I, and yeah, I forgive it. Un, unless, again, it's you know one. And it's not being out of tune isn't even really a mistake. It's just a thing that happens, right? Because it, of the, it's a physical, phys, right? Manifestation, yeah. yeah. But what I'm saying is that you know it's funny to me that people with non-tuned instruments, right? You know, will be so quick to jump on a guitar player's back. Uh, what I'm saying is, is a guitar player goes through a mental checklist of the pluses and minuses of dealing with a problem in, in the moment. You see, you Versus, guitar players, you think it's all about you. When I get is. on a guitar, no, it's totally. not. When I get totally. on a guitar player about being out of tune, it's because it's screwing up harmonies. It's screwing up, right? Like if somebody, again, if it happens in the middle of a song, whatever, like things happen. It's it, And that's actually when a guitar will go out of tune. Rarely does it slip out, you know, magically after the song is over, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that it's fine. But again, if it's, if it's happening over and like if it's if it's perpetuating where it's it's not being fixed or it's happening constantly to that same instrument it's like okay wait a minute you know i'm i i i play the drums but i also sing i i most definitely play an instrument that is you know part of the tonal scale and absolutely when a guitar is out of tune like harmonies especially will start to really be a problem understood but and three songs would be a bit much for a guy to stay out of tune however if the first second you hear something Mm -hmm. my point is a guitar player is like all right listen i can isolate that one string and play around it i can tune up right now i can you know i can wait till the end of the song there is a mental checklist of decisions going on by a checklist by by guitars in real time about how to deal with this like you said it's not a mistake right it's a problem and if a guitar is out of tune for multiple songs at a time you know, if a guy's not bringing a healthy instrument to his gig, that's that's a different problem. But what I'm saying is uh, it is counterproductive for for to jump on a guitar player. You know, the second you hear something out of tune, don't totally. assume he does. Well, it's, a, it's counterproductive to highlight even if there is a mistake. Right. It's counterproductive to highlight that the moment it happens in most cases. Again, if it's chronic that kind of thing. Sure. Okay. Now we, we need to have a conversation, but on stage probably isn't the right place to have that conversation regardless. <laughs> yes. Right. You know, so it's, it's the difference between something chronic and, and I have dealt with guitar players who, you know, I'll hear in the middle of a tune. It's like, Oh man, his D string is way out, you know, and we'll get to the end of the tune and I'll just glance to look, to make sure he's going to tune up. And if he's going to start the next song, it's like, whoa, 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 dude, mm. string, like, don't forget, That's you, know, fair. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. And, and because it, because now it's going to, you know, cascade a little bit and it's like, no, 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 get like, take a breath. Let's dial it back in. One of us will talk to the crowd while you, you know, fix that or, or whatever, yep. you know, that kind of thing. So it, it's, it, it, again, it's not, um, 
it, at least when it's coming from me, it's most definitely not an I can't like I'm, I've been waiting all night to point out your error. Like, you know, like that's not <laughs> what it is. It's more like I am as the drummer and also just as me being Dave, uh, I, you know, I take on the role of producer on like the onstage producer. Like, you know, most of the time drums are set up all the way upstage so you can kind of see everybody is everybody singing their harmonies? Is everybody, you know, engaged in the way they need to be engaged? Is there anything going on that I need to be aware of? Because perhaps somebody needs to tune and the guy that's going to start the next song doesn't know that that guy way over there has something going on or broke a string or whatever. So there's this constant sort of awareness that's happening. And the drummer's vantage point really does give me, a, a generally speaking, a better spot to see any of that from than anybody else. And so there's this constant thing that's going on. So if we get to the end of a tune and I don't wait to see if the guitar player is going to tune, I just turn to him like, you, you got that right. You, you know, like that's that's a one for all, all for one sort of thing where it's like we're all in this together and we're all putting on the best product. And I just want to make sure I there's no reason for me to wait to see if you know you're out of tune. I can just ask you, do you know? Yep. OK, great. And now you're on it and off we go. So, so there is that it, the, the different perspectives, uh, from, you know, from the front of the stage to the back of the stage, it, it, it does make a difference, you know, in term, it. just in terms of making the show. No, happen. I'll agree. And, and me in the front of the stage, I'm usually facing the audience and focused on the audience. Correct. So some stuff that's going on behind me, you know, again, it's hard to be leader and musical director at the same time. That's, that's almost impossible to do actually. You, you can't front, you're talking about like front man and musical yeah. director. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, in fact, there was a moment at your gig the other night where. You were turned, you had, it was either you or Russ, your drummer, who started the tune, but you cued him to start the tune and Simon was effectively behind you because you were turned and he, he needed to tune or he needed to do something. There was some problem and he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And the song started and it was like, oh, mm. yep, okay. But, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm probably the only person in the room other than Simon that noticed that, you know. Actually, what that was is even more interesting and a, and a good conversation. So there was a song on a set list that uh, was, is, you know, it's the most challenging song Simon has to sing. And he said, it's a game time decision uh, and it was game time. Uh, <laughs> and I just pushed on and, and he wanted to weigh in on, you know, whether he could do it. And, and so we just, you know, w went ahead and played the song. So that was actually an interesting thing as well. Do uh, you and your band, do you guys like, s before you go on stage, do you kind of do a quick read through the a set list and talk about where, where, um, where audibles might happen because of anything going on? A guy, again, a guy could be sick or, you know, yep. just not feeling a certain song. Do you totally. actually do a group read of a set list? Not in a, not in a formal way. We, we definitely do for like a madhouse. We, but that's a whole different thing, but for a, like a fling gig, we will, we will all have discussed it enough that, those of us that are kind of managing the show and it, which is usually me and or Russ, uh, we almost hand the baton back and forth throughout the show, but we're aware of, okay, like this song might need to be skipped. You know, we talk, we, yes. So we do talk through that where it's a, yeah, yeah. It's a thing. Yeah. So that's what happened on that one. That makes sense. Well, so in that sense, I had no idea that, that Simon was, was worried about that tune or struggling. He, whatever it was, he killed it because he killed everybody. Yeah. yeah. So that, so that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, I, I mentioned Russ. I want to call him out uh, and thank him. He did something that was so kind and welcoming. It's a weird thing for some drummers to have uh, maybe maybe it's a weird thing for all drummers just at different levels you know you have your own drums they're yours you bring them there you set them up you tune them you you position them the way that you want them positioned and then he invites me to you know and he knows that i'm coming to sit on his kit right this is a you know predetermined decision and in instead of just being gracious about it he went the extra mile he heard us talking about these new sticks that I've been using, these Vic Firth 5B double glazes, and he was interested in trying them out for himself. So he went out and bought a pair, and instead of trying them first, he handed me a new pair of sticks knowing <laughs> that, and it was such a welcoming thing, because I've sat in on some drummer's kits where it's like, I get that we're going to do this, but I also <laughs> understand that you are like thoroughly pissed about this scenario, right? You know, like the, someone else made a decision and it's happening and we're both going to deal with it, but you are not happy about it. Right. You know, and, uh, 
nothing could have been further from the message that uh. Russ communicated to me in every way. So, uh, yeah, really, really good guy. And I have to say, I know it's the second time in uh, in a couple of weeks that I've mentioned these sticks. These Vic Firth 5B double glazes, they are. So I, I grew up using Capella. First, it was Capella 5As. Capella was a company in New Jersey that made drumsticks for everybody. They were basically like the, the house brand everywhere, but they were also making drumsticks, I think, for even Vic Firth, but certainly for other name brand manufacturers. And uh, and I found that I really liked their 5As and then their 5As got weird. And so I started using their 5Bs and then their 5Bs got weird. And I asked them and I had forgotten about this when we talked about it the last time I found an email I don't know, almost 20 years ago where I had asked him, I'm like, Hey, cause I started buying my sticks directly from them and their quality control sucked. But I had asked him, I'm like, Hey, can you like double glaze? I, I, I said, can you shellac them a second time to give them some more grip to thicken them up? They're like, there's just, there was something in their process that, that just got worse and worse over the years and adding the glaze to them really like, you know, fixed a lot of things for me. And to find these Vic Firth sticks, I had completely forgotten that I had had Capella doing that. It was just a standing thing on my order for, you know, 15 years or whatever. And until I felt these sticks, it was like, oh, no wonder I haven't been able to find anything that matches what I was used to because this is what I asked for. So it and it turns out that the Capella blades are either exactly the same as the ones that Vic Firth uses to cut the the taper of the stick and the bead of the stick, or they're really, really close. Uh, some mm. folks I know in the drumstick industry, which is very, very small, told me they're like, oh, yeah, the Capella 5, 5A and 5B blades, they, those went to Vic Firth. The, like, that's the stick you want. And I bought some. I'm like, yeah, this isn't what I want. And so I had some custom ones made. And then it turns out these these double glaze, that was the trick. So I'm very, very happy that Vic Firth is is making these. So I just wanted to. Uh, very cool. Yeah. You find the tool that you need. Yeah. It's, uh, just it's like close business. on Russ there. You know, I have to yeah. say, it doesn't surprise me that Russ did that. Russ is that guy. He's remarkable, great musician. And we're so happy to have him in our band. He'd been in, I think we've talked about this before. He'd been in the same band, you know, among other side projects, but his main band, he'd been in the same band for almost 50 years. And he formed with his brother. That was a successful band in the Bay Area meant something to so many people, you know, played pretty much every high school dance, so many weddings, like was just a part of this community's musical vibe for so long. And when that band Sage retired, you know, it, and we knew those guys cause you know, we were two horn yeah, bands. You, you and, had mentioned them on the show a couple of times. Yeah. yeah. But you know, Russ is just an incredible human being. So for him to show that type of magnanimity, you know, and make you feel welcome, that maps to who he is and, you know. Totally, and, yeah. And it maps to the type of guy he is to have in a band. Like, you talk about the concept of being a generous musician, and to me, that is a, a musician who's invested in the group being successful, not worried about his spotlight, you know, yep. worried about the team. And I, you know, Russ is like, Russ, even though he's incredibly talented, I would say Russ is kind of like, the loyal offensive lineman on a, on a football team, like incredibly important gives up his body. So the, the team can be successful on a yeah. regular basis. That's, that's the analogy I'd have for, for our drummer. He's just, he's an awesome guy. And you know, he's a great a, drummer he, too. I mean, great I, drummer, like every addition. style. Yeah. yeah. Student, you know, it's, he's so fun to play with. And so I'm, I'm glad that two of my good guys, you know, get along well together and can kind of have that little bit of a bond. And, and, uh, but what you say surprises nobody who knows for us because, he's just that guy that's awesome yeah no it was it was such a nice thing to walk into sound check and have him hand me sticks i even thought about bringing my own sticks i'm like that's kind of a douchey move like I, I don't know. <laughs> like i'll just use his sticks like I, it's three songs it's i'm it's not like i'm trying to go play some rush tune or you know some zappa tune or whatever like these are meat and potatoes rock and roll worst comes to worst i can turn them around play with the butt end and i'm good to go you know like this is this does we do not need to overthink this and walk in looking like that guy but um i sure was happy to have those sticks there <laughs> but you know mutual respect from other musicians i mean totally. to some guys it's not it's it's not that big a deal but i think if you Think of yourself as a musician, you know, and you're part of the brother sisterhood of yeah. of musicians just trying to put some art into the world. Those acts of kindness, they really go a long way. I would like to be think that, you know, I, I've put something into the world that other musicians value and I have a decent reputation. I hope that's the case. That would be important to me. Sure. Yeah. Well, it clearly is. It's who Russ is, whether it's important to him or not. I, I mean, I assume it is, but it also is just who he is, which is it great. just who he is. Yeah. Yep. 
Um, all right. So we got we got a couple of a uh, couple of notes. I'll start with the one from Kevin. because I think this is a shorter conversation. But Kevin says, uh, uh, I love the show. So thank you. We love you, too, Kevin. This is great. He <laughs> says, uh, I'm a key. And no, we really like I, I know I'm glossing over sort of the, 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 the you know, the, the greetings and stuff at the beginning of these notes. But we like it really is great to, to hear from everybody. We say it every show and we totally mean it. It, it really is great. It's such a nice, pleasant little, you know, uh, taste of sweetness in the middle of the day when when an email from one of you comes in. It's like, oh, yeah, right. Cool. Uh, he says, I'm a keys player and can totally answer your question you posed a while back for why there are a shortage of keys players who can just lay it down. As you all know, guitar, bass and drums are more of an oral history. People take private lessons for these instruments for sure, but even private lessons become part of that oral history in a lot of ways where the student wants to learn, you know, Stairway to Heaven or Tom Sawyer or whatever. Keyboardists, he says, have usually come from a more formal background, which is incredibly regimented and does not include this oral history component. So while many players are able to read well, they're not instructed and encouraged in the ways of just sitting down at their instrument and emoting. Some of my keyboard compatriots and I, on the other hand, have always treated keys playing as an oral history. There's no rule that says we can't. We took the education path of learning technique from records. We pride ourselves on the fact that not only do we know the staple 50 as far as covers go, but we can listen and pick stuff up quickly, which increases our value as a pickup or a sub player. But what's frustrating is there's not enough of us. If I needed to sub out a gig, there are only two guys I know of in my area that I can count on, and they're both busy all the time. I don't know enough keys players who can just lay it down. He says, if I were auditioning for either of your bands, I can guarantee that I would be able to lay it down. But just like any guitarist, bass player or drummer, I can't guarantee that I'd be the right guy for the for the gig due to chemistry, vibe, etc. Hope this sheds a little more light on the subject and creates some more dialogue. It, it He's totally right. As a drummer, a typical path. I mean, the path that I took is 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 it's not the only one, but it is a typical one where drums are an instrument that you can learn and, and, and play in like band in school and orchestra and those sorts of things. But then drum set, certainly there were some things in school and I, I was taught drum set initially in school, but it, that becomes that oral history, right? So it, 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 it's definitely a part of a natural part of learning the instrument, whereas, whereas keys, it's not necessarily a natural part of it. Um, you know, a, a piano player in, you know, in high school and, and, you know, college in that range can play enough without being in a rock band. Whereas Mm. a drum set player, even though you come from that world of playing in orchestras and things like that, you're probably not playing drum set enough to scratch that itch. So it's like, Hey, we should start a band, you know? And, and certainly with guitar players and bass players, like that's like oftentimes the path that you take. It's like, Oh, I've been playing guitar long enough. Like I want to start a band. I want to play more. And it's like starting a band is the way to, to, like to do that. So I, yeah, I see what he's saying. Um, for sure. I think, yeah, yeah players I, I would the same say, way. I would add to this, that if you think about the popular music use of keyboards over time, right. So, you know, you had honky tonk piano players, you know, Jimmy Johnson with Chuck Berry and, you know, they, they played piano, right. They had to come from some, you know, formal method of learning dexterity and, you know, that type of thing, uh, you know, through the late sixties and B3 players and, you know, you know, the, the, the evolution of that from church music into popular music, you know, certainly through the seventies more, but then all of a sudden as we started getting into synth type players and then keyboards were often more triggers and sounds pads then they were formal playing, you know, a large you know, amount of the 80s start, certainly started that. And then there, there's not a ton of I'm trying to think in the 90s, you know, you know, certainly grunge and, you know, that type of thing. The the path of, of keyboards value in popular music changed a little bit. That's true. Um, and, uh, well, and, it, and so, you don't need a keyboard player for a typical rock band like you can form a rock band with a guitar, bass and drums. You can right. also form a rock band with keys, bass and drums. Right. Like I've I've seen that. In fact, I've played gigs with just keys and drums. Right. You know, yeah. but generally speaking, 
if you're if you're thinking of especially when you're you know in high school or whatever and you're thinking of starting a rock band it's like well i needed you know a guitar player a bass player or a drummer which one am i now i need the other two you, you know and keys i could not imagine not having keys in a band i mean in terms of a I band's agree. ability to change its tonal offerings you know to change the moods to you know go for cuz you know if you're a three piece band yeah you can change some guitar tones but in general you know it's going to be guitar driving music right absolutely i just could not fathom trying to play the music that i like to play um rearranged without keys i mean keys just offer such an important you know, feeling, you know, tones, the way they help a band pick up when a band kicks in, you know, there's just so much that, that I think he's offering. It is a shame that there's not enough keyboard players. I mean, I think that's the most accurate thing is that, you know, whether it's a, a sign of the times that kids don't have the attention span anymore to get that formal. And I, that's what I'm saying is formally trained <clears throat> Uh, you know, reading is important. Nick doesn't read, you know, he reads chord charts, but he doesn't really re read notation. Oh, okay. He's, pretty, What's he's his... pretty much a self-taught. Okay. He had, an, he had an aunt who was a concert pianist and she gave him some lessons, but he was, you know, mostly a ear and self-taught pretty, you know, remarkable how far he's gotten. Well, uh, but, then, you know, but like, so he learned to play keys the way most guitar players learn to play guitar. Like it, yeah. like it in the way that, that, um, that Kevin's describing here, this oral history of just listen and and learn, not, you know, read this, read this from a book kind of thing. Oh, that's interesting. It that's makes right. sense. Yeah. He, is, he is a keyboard but, player that plays like a guitar player plays a guitar. Like he's he's that kind of guy, kind of like that horn player that I talked about, that guy Cam that sat yeah. in with the wedding band where he just showed up and played. You didn't need to give him charts. He just listened and, and played his horn. You know, and, and that's what Nick does with the keys. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's really true. And yeah. I, I hope that the trend turns that some music will come in. I mean, you know, for guitar players, we have the John Mayers and Joe Bonamassa still coming out that are kind of setting the inspirational levels. I'm trying to think who, who the keyboard, you know, and when we were kids, we had the Jan Hammers and Rick Wakeman's and, and uh, you know, Keith Emerson's that kind of set that bar. I'm trying to think who would be that in modern, yeah. in modern popular music. I don't I mean, know. Mayor would be the most obvious for the guitar players, right? You know, to kind of stand up as a guy who is a guitar slinger, right? You know, gets up there and yeah. gives you something to shoot for, inventive. But um, yeah, I mean, and also, I mean, a little bit of a side track, but you know, popular music now is so different. I'm, I'm finding with like we in my solo acoustic stuff, well, actually, even in the house rockers, we have a couple of, you know, recently newer songs. It's amazing to me that the songwriting style for a lot of these is the exact same chords all the way through the song was just a little bit of a different emphasis between verses and choruses. Isn't right? that bizarre? It drives me it crazy. It is really weird. Yeah. There's it, like, there's literally the same four it chords is, over yeah, a uh, lot of the a, Taylor Swift stuff is exactly that. Yeah. And, and like those are written by, I mean, she's a decent songwriter. Like the, you can you can change something and make the chorus more interesting, you know, <laughs> but you're right. Like there's a lot of these songs out there that just aren't written all that well from a. So you wonder if the demanding nature, you know, of keys with, you know, bass notes that, that lay over over chords and, you know, that change, you know, whether that's, is, you know, really the style that we're in right now. I don't know. That's just pontificating a little bit. Yeah. You just wonder if like a few things have, are, are joining at the meeting at the same time to diminish the emphasis of keyboards. But I don't know. It just, it just seems the sounds. I mean, again, I think about Nick, he plays, he plays an you know, acoustic piano sound, a road sound, clav sound, uh, you know, B3 sound, some effect sounds. Um, on occasion, he'll dig into his keyboard. If we need to add a, a percussive sound on top of something Russ is doing, we can do that because we don't have a percussion player. Sure. I mean, just the, the versatility, the oral versatility and the mood versatility that keys offer is just so incredible. I couldn't imagine trying to emote music without having a keyboard. I mean, I, I, you know, you have a band going full tilt, 10 guys to follow it up with a song that starts with vocals only over piano. Talk about going from, you know, a 10 to a four to set up a mood in an audience. You know, few things can do that than just uh, vocals and keys. Yeah, I agree. I, yeah. No, I, I love having keys in the band. It, and I, I mean, I like it from the, you know, the, the sonic palette that it gives you. 
But also, it's nice having another percussionist on stage. Like there, there is a thing that that happens between keyboard players and and drummers, right? Like it, it, this is a thing that you are hitting with your hand. I mean, piano is a percussion instrument, right? And and there's a a thing like guitar has no attack. You can make a guitar like sort of have attack, but it doesn't really. Not like a, a snare drum or a piano does, where you can really like hit a note. And so having that that rhythmic think about that. interaction um, is makes a huge difference. Really, I, I yeah, makes a big difference on stage. So get your kids keyboard lessons, piano lessons. Yeah, and then and then just like play them songs and 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 get them playing you know songs on on uh, with, with bands. Like that's yeah. that's the key. Um, where are we on time? Oh yeah, we got time for this one. Okay, so Richard has has a question that some of us might not want to hear but uh he's gonna ask it anyway he says uh dave and paul are we authentic now or are we too old to rock is aging out of the cover band scene a thing my Mm. band got into a discussion on this he says after playing a great gig last weekend at a bar in san francisco called maggie mcgarry's it was packed with people all of them in their 20s my band is mostly 50 plus playing a good mix of older and newer rock and pop covers The crowd was dancing and singing along the whole time, and we all had a blast. But there was no denying that this was basically the parents on stage entertaining a crowd the age of our own kids. Kind of weird when you step back and think about it that way. We sometimes get that playing suburban bars, too, when the crowd our age goes home to bed and the post-college kids take over after midnight. When we're playing to a crowd our own age, I always feel like the audience is happy and reassured to see a band their own age still rocking out. It makes everyone feel young. And we're sort of celebrating that together. But what was this 20 something crowd thinking about a band, their parents age on stage rocking out? I'm wondering if rock and roll is performed by a live rock band is now an old enough genre that it just seems authentic to have a 50 something band playing it. It is our music after all, or perhaps the music of a generation past us. Sort of like going into a blues or jazz club and seeing a bunch of older players. That seems authentic and what you'd expect. We're so much older than this crowd now, they could not possibly think we're trying to fit in and be a part of their scene. Maybe at 40, you look like you're trying too hard to pose as a young rock star, but at 55, is it just all cool? Are we at a point where the rock genre, uh, in the rock genre, where a 25-year-old band doing these covers would look like posers? The truth probably is that this is something I think about and the crowd could care less. They're there to drink, dance, and have a big sing-along. So he shares a few other related thoughts. Age specifications in Craigslist ads for band members are definitely a thing, sometimes for marketing reasons and always, he says, for social reasons. And all other things being equal is a cover band with two 30 year old front persons easier to market than one with two 50 year old front persons. Uh, You know, I don't know. That's a good question. And he says in the real pro music industry, there's no question that there's a premium on youth. But some artists like Springsteen or Sheryl Crow unquestionably have a body of work to keep touring as long as they want without it being seen as them trying to milk it. On the other hand, did you see Air Supply perform on last season's finale of The Bachelor? The answer to that is no, and for several reasons. But um, uh, he says it seemed very cringeworthy to trot out these 70-year-old guys to play music in that setting, even though they played it well enough. He says, personally, the older I get, the more grateful I am to be actively gigging. Nobody I play with takes it for granted anymore. So thanks for this, Richard. Yeah. And there's uh, a lot in there. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack there's a lot in there. Here. Yeah. So, so here's my first thought on this. Um, performing live music is a visual medium as much as it is a sonic or oral, A-U-R-A-L medium, right? Mm-hmm. It is a visual medium. I don't believe that there is a age limit for what you do um, in any of these things. I can think of a dozen great bands made up of incredibly experienced musicians, probably into their late sixties, if not early seventies. Um, I'm talking cover bands, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. They are seasoned pros who have been doing it for years, and they bring it every time you see them, and you know what you're going to get, and they don't pretend to be younger the way they deal with younger material is smart you know they 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 don't jump around like they're a grunge band if they're going to play a nirvana song they they find a way to make it true to what they're 
what their vibe is, but they have a vibe. And I think this is a big part of it. So this whole question about age is a, it's a sensitive thing for a lot of people. But, you know, the thing is this, like I said, we start with the premise that live music is a is a visual medium. So are you what do you look like? You know, do you, are you overweight, underweight? Are you dressed? Okay. Do you perform? Do you, you know, do you put something out? I believe it's universal. If you take care of all that type of stuff, I think you can go play a college and go over, you know, in wherever you are. I'm going to point to one of the really great bands in the Bay area called pride and joy. I mean, these are some amazingly seasoned professionals playing largely Motown music, okay. but they could put that show on anywhere and get people having a good time. I I think live music is so dominated by older music, you know, especially in dance venues. Live music is really, you know, Motown still goes over well, you know, classic rock goes over well. I don't, I mean... I, I would have to ask, like I could ask my kids, you know, they get a kick out of good music played that a whole scene is, you know, and where are you playing it? Are you playing it in a college bar? Are you playing it in a, in a bar where like, you know, I talk about the bar where we play, where we play from seven 30 to ten fifteen, and then, and then the a DJ, DJ comes in up. after. Yep. Right. And, and in general, you know, we are drawing a little bit older, older crowd for when we play. But I think the the basic premise is, you know, in everything you read, there's a bunch of like, almost like he's made the decision himself. Like, it sounds like he's asking the question, but he kind of, you know, has come to a conclusion. It sounded like, I think that if you accept on face value that performing live music is a visual medium and you got to take care of all the details. Again, if you're overweight, are you wearing appropriate clothes? If you are... You know, do you have any kind of a show? Do you have any kind of interaction uh, that lights, works for all right? audiences? I mean, do don't you have forget a, about that. Yeah. Because right? like, yeah. to your point. How do you look? How professional are right. you? And if you want to minimize the effects, you know, don't be a sloppily dressed, you know, shoegazing older guy trying to play carry on my wayward son, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, and like yeah. you, you haven't seen my fastball. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> Watch this solo. You know, I think that's the stuff that, that will get you feeling old when you think your, your go-to stuff, you know, from when you were younger, when it was hot to you, just because it means a lot to you, is that by definition going to mean a lot to every audience that you have? I don't, I don't think so. I just think you start with that basic premise. Do you have, and I'm not saying you have to wear costumes. I'm not saying you have to have shtick. I'm just saying whatever good truth brings your performance to light. And, you know, to me, I just think it's, you know, clean dress, pretty conservative, you know, unless you've got guys in your band that are weird and, you know, you know, they dress weird and that's their truth and that'll come out. But I think what makes things look old is, uh, you know, when you stop to respect the thing that music promises people, which is like, if you lay it on the line, regardless of age, regardless of venue, if you honestly lay it on the line, it is a universal thing that you can go over. He made the point about seeing older jazz um, players. I walked into um, a venue uh, about a week ago and it was a, ja it was a jazz jam night. And there was a girl, uh, an 18 year old going to Juilliard playing bass. She had everybody's jaw on the floor and everybody felt so good to see such a young player. So passionate about, about pure jazz. I mean, I don't, I don't think age, you know, if you were recording something, would you record something meaningful? You know, that, then it's not a visual medium, right? You know, is your music fresh? Is your music, you know, communicated with passion? So all this stuff is what I'm saying is that it sounded like the premise that he had is he was asking for validation more than more than answer. And I, and I kind of I kind of reject the validation part of that. I actually think if you accept the concept that live music is a visual medium and that you have to find your way to make your visual medium um, pop in whatever audiences you want to play for. You know, if you're a jazz jam band, you have a little bit of leeway where it is the emphasis on your instrumentation and on your experimentation that, you know, can happen, but you're probably not going to play that in a dance club, you know, in San Francisco on a Friday night. Nope. And so that's right. how do you, how do you go over? And I think that's the thing. It's a visual medium. Yeah, it it is. I mean, it's it. But then th there's a lot of ways to do it. I'm I'm not I um I, you like to talk about truth a lot. I'm not sure 
that that is the only way to do this. I, I think you can choose to go and put out a put on a show that represents something different than you would represent, uh, you know, elsewhere in your life. And that that's OK. Right. I mean, people are into theater all the time. If you think about your rock show like a theater show, I mean, look at what Queen did, right? Like that's that's. But even in the theater show, the, the actors are finding the truth in the characters that they portray. Sure, sure, but but it's not them. But I guess is is the point is you can go and be something else on stage. You can have a persona as long as you can deliver that in a way that's entertaining and engaging, right? If someone sees it as if you if you communicate it in a way that it it seems like you're trying to be you're failing at trying to be something you're not. It's different. Trying to be something you're not is actually fine as long as you succeed. Failing at that is a problem. Right. You know, I mean, look at Kiss. Right. They go on stage. I mean, they've got this whole thing. That's not really who those guys are. Like, they, you know, if you go to their house and like hang out with them, they're not going to be dressed like that or acting like that, you know. Uh, some lead singers do. There was, I mean, back in the eighties, everybody talked about David Lee Roth syndrome, right? Where it didn't matter whether he was on stage or not. That's how he acted. But most people are not like that. And you can go on stage. And, and I mean, you're not like that either, right? You have your stage persona. It is, it is consistent. You are good at it. You deliver it. But in person, you're not, you know, doing that kind of stuff in a, in a, you know, in a everyday sense. And that's OK. You know, figure out what you're what you're capable of doing. So let's 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 cross the it. lines here. How about this? Yeah, I think we're actually saying the same thing in a different way. So so what I would. Yeah, I think we are. Is, I was I, I wanted to clarify this because I, I don't want people to feel like what we're saying is you just you have to go and represent 100 percent of you on stage. I mean, if, if you're an accountant, um that could be your stick on. No, I mean, like, like, you know, that could be your stick on stage. Look, James Taylor, I don't know if he's an accountant or not, but he certainly has played that card for a killer career. Right. Like he doesn't say he's an accountant, but he goes on stage and he looks like pretty much every accountant I've ever shown up and, and worked with. You know, <laughs> he doesn't look like a rock star. And, and I think and, the thing that we're saying is it works for him. That It does work for him. That thing that you decide is. What I, let, let me expand my concept of truth here. You are right. That thing on stage that's going to communicate your music to your audience and provide them the entertainment most successfully. If it's not happening successfully, it's it's not happening. It's you know, not happening. That's right. Take the score. Yeah. And if you're kissing, it means, you know, you need to put on this otherworldly makeup you know type of thing. If that's the thing that's going to get your music, the total vibe to communicate to communicate the feeling that you want your audience to have, Ch Kiss made that choice, right? Yep, totally. Pride and joy, you know, the guys are in suits, the women are in sequin dresses. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's their thing. Clean, you know, throwback 60s, you know, uh, Tammy show, you know, that's, that's their thing, right? Yep. Us, we're just kind of like, you know, because I have this conversation in my band all the time, right? You know, some guys are like, you know, dress doesn't matter. And, and I'm like, I'm sharing with you, dress matters. It is the visual medium. Of course. And I'm not asking oh. you to put on, yeah. I'm not asking you to dress, you know, bizarre. Our thing is like seasoned, funky professionals yeah. that that's kind of what i want us to be like yeah. like we respect the stage you know we understand there's a difference between being on stage and off stage right dress dress well enough that you make it special for people is is my direction you know to my band rather than dress my band individually which i'll tell you there was a point in time where i certainly thought about getting a stylist in here to kind of figure out you know how we could because I don't know how to shop for some of these guys, right? Sure. Yeah, of course. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that's the thing is I'm like, you know, vests are good. Hats are good. So you know. Accessorize. I, and that's a, yeah. like, that's a thing is be okay. Like many of us, I will say this about me in person. You won't see me accessorize much at all on stage. I try to do a little bit more. I, I, I'm getting to the point. I mean, how long have I been doing this where I'm comfortable wearing a little bit more with like a vest or a necklace or, or a hat or, you know, glasses or something that that is, you know, more than just, hey, look, it's a guy in T-shirt and jeans, right? Like, yeah, but I do. I do T-shirt and blazer and jeans and it just dresses it up enough. It where dresses it, it up it, enough. Yeah, it is special on stage than it is off stage. We respect the audience. We, you know, perceive that uh, we are the actors in this performance and That's you are it. the consumer. Right. I yeah. think that. And so that all goes back to this question is like, you know, 
is how did he phrase it originally? Is uh, it I'm going to rephrase authentic? it. Is there a glass ceiling to the cover band world? Right. I mean, that's really what he's asking is like, what's the glass Th- that ceiling? is age defined? Yes. Age defined. And I, I don't think there is. I, I think I think like like he pointed out some bands, uh, certainly when they're you know, I see this on Craigslist all the time where people say there's, you know, like we want Pete, somebody between, you know, 25 and 35 or we want somebody between 40 and 60 or, you know, whatever. Rarely do you see somebody say, yeah, somebody between 20 and 70 that can really shred on guitar. That never <laughs> happens. Right. It's just like, you know, that's just how it goes. I wonder if, the, if a large part of that is trying to get a guy in a similar stage of life with a similar set of values less than. We, you know, like I want a guy who has a full time job, you know, yeah. for all weekend wars. I wonder if that's more about that than it is about about vibe. Let I me ask you. Think I think that's your, right. About your local scene. Yeah. Cover band scene. Yep. M- more bands that are 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, yeah, that's a good question. There's I would say from what I see at the clubs that have you know, that kind of music, it's, 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 it trends older, like not twenties and thirties, more forties and fifties. Yeah. 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 And a couple of sixties. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 There's a group in my area that is, you know, a bunch of guys have been around a while. I'm pretty sure they're all over 60. They're really good musicians and they still bring it. And, um, you know, there's a combination of that. They have 40 years of fans built up, you know, sure. collect, they're kind of like an all-star group, you know, around here. Um, they have collectively, you know, good fan bases around here. They still play great. You know, they're in their sixties and um, I, you watch them and you know, ages, you don't think that, I mean, a, they're all in pretty good shape. They still bring it musically, you know, the, the, it's just music. It's, you know, you're, they almost age is taken out of the equation because right. everything else seems to be clicking. There's a, always a bunch of people who are digging it in the crowd. When you see them, they look fine. Um, they play great. Um, it, you know, so age is out of it. So that old concept of a glass ceiling, like most things in life, it is what you make it. Sometimes you have to adapt to go through a glass ceiling. Um, and I think that that's a large part what's going on here. I mean, I think for this guy, cool that he's getting good club dates in San Francisco on a weekend night. So clearly they play well and uh, they have a product that people want. But I think that sensitivity, you know, we play a CeeLo tune. We play a bunch of Bruno Mars tunes. We play some newer stuff. Um, if I was to play, oh, CeeLo's not that new anymore. True, 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 true. (laughs) I'll tell you what, we play a, we play a, we play a Jesse J song. So this, a a woman singer, girl singer, and we just kind of set it up. And the whole point of the song, we, we made our own very house rocker, big, big horn section arrangement to it. It, there's a tinge of irony that is part of the delivery to it, you know, and I think I even say sometimes like, you know, for this next song, Nick's going to channel a 22 year old girl or something like that. And yeah. there's just a moment of it and it just lightens it for a second when, uh, when people are wondering what we're going to do. And then the band plays this great, powerful arrangement of it and it works. So and some it of it is being smart. Right. It doesn't matter. It's just a song. It's just a good song. Yep. So. Yep. Yep. It's true. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. So no glass ceiling. Don't think that way. I, yeah, I don't I don't think it exists in a general sense. If you look for it, you can find it. I'm sure there are, you, you know, create some, it for yourself. Well, you can create it for yourself, but certainly there's going to be a club. I, I mean, you know, we're talking to the, the entire planet here. Somebody's going to say, oh, yeah, there's a club that won't hire a band with a member over 30 or whatever. Like, OK, fine. There's probably clubs that won't hire bands with female members. There's probably clubs that won't hire bands with male members. Like you can find all of these restrictions uh, but in a general sense, I don't uh, it, it, like I don't I don't see it. Um, I think it's it. Can you play? And when when I say can you play, it's like, can you to your point, you know, can you deliver a show? And part of that show, it, like it, 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 there's a visual element and there's a musical element. And for some bands, it's more visual than it is musical. And for other bands, it's more musical than it is visual. But but there is a package and you need to play up your strength and don't don't augment your weakness. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. Find what works for you. And then like, man, go out and deliver the heck out of it every time. All right. Well, that's what I got. That's good. I, I think about go back and look at 
at videos of people that you like performing when they were earlier in their career and how they would burn it down every night. I mean, you know, think about those guys as they were coming up um, and the little clubs that they would play and how they, you know, think about the Beatles playing six nights a week, yeah. <laughs> you know, right. I mean, that concept that you are, I just saw, I just saw rocket man. Right. And I was thinking about, you know, that, that path that Elton John took to, to, uh, you know, his stardom and these guys burned it down every night, umpteen nights a week. It, that doesn't change as you get older. Your body may not be able to do the same things that you did back then. Sure. But the, the demand to, to requirement to deliver what I always tell my band is, our job is to give something more than, than what money can buy, right? You, you want to give someone an experience. And if you're not committed to that, if you're not full on in like, you know, that one person whose heart is breaking out there tonight, we're going to play something for them and, you know, change their life, save their life. If you don't kind of have that vibe going with you every single time you strap it on, you probably, you know, you're probably in the wrong profession. Yeah. You can't do, you can't do rock and roll half ass. That's pretty much it. Yeah. You got to go out and deliver. Yeah, and, and, and you need to do it individually, but you also need to make sure as a band, you're on the same page and you're out sure. delivering. And if, so if you've got one guy in the band that's like, oh man, we're too old to be playing this club. Whoa. Like you are, you, you are, you just, you just said it. You defined <laughs> your truth. That's it. Yeah. yeah. You want to talk about truth. That kind of thing becomes true immediately. As soon as you say it, man, like you got to erase that thought, purge it away because you got to go out and deliver. You got to believe that you're out there, man. Maybe the that's good thing is with covers, a lot of your work is done for you. You can play honky tonk woman any night, anywhere and make somebody happy. It's so true. That's right. You got to have those back pocket tunes like, well, I don't know if Sweet Home Alabama anymore is uh, is currently the, they, there's too much politically going on in Alabama. I'm, I don't that's know true. If that's the one I I've been ready. I haven't put it on any fling set list lately because I just don't know who is going to respond the wrong way. Didn't seem to have any trouble the other night, so that was good. But um, <laughs> but I've got the the lyrics for that Kid Rock song in my head, just in case Russ starts yep. Sweet Home Alabama. I'll just sing that instead. <laughs> but no, you get you get a little you get a little political baggage with Kid Rock now, so you got to figure that out as well. Oh, I guess that's true. Everybody's got political. Yeah, you know what? Just play yeah. the song. Just deliver play the it. song. That's it. Just deliver it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the cure gets away with playing killing an Arab. So, you know, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, maybe there you go. That's what well, I, and I, actually, I, you know what? That's not a bad place to end this conversation. If you think about the cure and Robert Smith doing what worked so well in the eighties when they were in their twenties and they're, you know, they're doing some special events now, right? Mm -hmm. They are, they are going to deliver that experience that they're, you know, and they're going to do it well again. And it's going to mean something to people. And, you know, I don't know. Is he going to get in full makeup and everything? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I there think that's go. his shtick, right? I mean, that's but, it. But to be fair, there is not a small dose of nostalgia that that sells those tickets, which is true for anybody there. I mean, he mentioned Springsteen and Cheryl Crow. Those people are definitely selling tickets based on nostalgia. Like there's no yeah, but question. Bruce's, Bruce's audience has amazing new fresh blood coming to it now. It does. I mean, you go to a Bruce, you know, Bruce show now and it's parents bringing their kids. Totally. And, you know, nostalgia is nostalgia is not the end. All. Saying, it's, it's, if it's, nostalgia gets people in for the experience, fine. Yeah. Um, but if you are sticky then nostalgia becomes schlocky and then that's then unfortunate. People don't come back again. But but yeah. I mean, the parents that are bringing their kids, it's it's nostalgia that feeds that. It's just like the Stones. I, well, the Stones, it's the, man, the Stones have been really smart. So they know that they tore on nostalgia and they're fine with it. Uh, they also know that for what, since 1989, they've been touring on the this might be the last time, you know, <laughs> like that's what, like seriously, everybody says that it's like, how many times are you going to buy the ticket before you realize that, you know, you've been bamboozled, but they're fine because they put on a decent show and, and people like it. And it's not you're not being bamboozled. You're just, you know, you're just going out and having a good time with the Rolling Stones. Like, that's not a bad thing. But um, and there's nothing wrong with those artists. I mean, people like that that have even even like, you know, Night Ranger they were totally happy to be a nostalgia act when, when I saw them, whatever, a couple of weeks ago, like they, you know, they know exactly who they are and they're totally fine with it. And it's way better than having a different job. You know, they, they are so happy to be able to go out there and play a song that they wrote that means something for people mm. like what? There's nothing like that's great for them. You know, it's cool. 
What? If I if I had had written songs that still meant something to people, I would happily go play Heck them. Yeah. Alone. Right? Heck yeah. You know, like what's the harm in that? That's, that's yeah. there's no harm. It's good. All right. That's all I got. What do you got? Anything else? That's fun. Those are really great questions that people send us today. Good conversations. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. That's where we want to uh, that's where we want to hear from you. That's that's the fuel that keeps this show going. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. We'll talk about tempos next time, man. I'll put it on the list. Good. Set Always tempos. be performing. Always be performing. Setting tempos during the gig. See you next time. <laughs>